十二日下午，毛泽东主席在中南海会见了美国国务卿兼总统国家安全事务助理亨利·基辛格。Handshakes in liminal landscapes, quoting Regis de Bry. What the blinding barbarian formula about the disenchantment of the world masks is, ultimately, the fact that every disenchantment of a symbolically invested realm, such as politics and its utopias today, precipitates the enchantment of another. Macron needs mental treatment. What else can be said about a head of state who does not understand freedom of belief and who behaves in this way towards millions of people living in his country? He had the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul converted back to a functioning mosque. At one time, it was Christendom's largest church and for decades a museum. Step by step, he's been moving away from the secular ideals of modern Turkey's founder, Kemal Ataturk. Is Erdogan pushing Turkey towards an Islamic dictatorship? From the influence of Weber's unfinished research into economic ethics of world religions, a plethora of authors have found it fruitful to explore the ways in which contemporary economic and political existence has been influenced, shaped, and underpinned by religious categories of thought. I did not make myself king. God did. King by divine right. Now you come to me in this document, seeking to limit the authority given to me by God. Sire, you give your word! No. The entire civilized world, the entire civilized world, may be in process for me. We'll follow closely what we do here. Then this is kein gewöhnlicher process, for this is not an ordinary trial. Then an üblichen abgesteckten Gerecht. By any means of the accepted parochial sense. The anerkannte Sinn dieses Gerichts, the above purpose of this tribunal, is broader than the visiting of retribution on a few men. It is dedicated to the reconsecration of the Temple of Justice. It is dedicated to finding a code of justice the whole world will be responsible to. How will this code be established? It will be established in a clear, honest evaluation of the responsibility for the crimes in the indictment stated by the prosecution. In the words of the great American jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, this responsibility will not be found only in documents that no one contests or denies. It will be found in considerations of a political or social nature. It will be found, most of all, in the character of men. What is the character of Ernst Young? Let us examine his life for a moment. He was born in 1885. Received the degree of Doctor of Law in 1907. Became a judge in East Prussia in 1940. Following World War I, he became one of the leaders of the Weimar Republic and was one of the framers of its democratic constitution. In subsequent years, he achieved international fame, not only for his work as a great jurist, but also as the author of legal textbooks which are still used in universities all over the world. He became Minister of Justice in Germany in 1935. If Ernst Janning is to be found guilty, certain implications must arise. A judge? does not make the laws, he carries out the laws of his country. The statement, my country, right or wrong, was expressed by a great American patriot. It is no less true for a German patriot. Should Ernst Janning have carried out the laws of his country, or should he have refused to carry them out and become a traitor? This is the crux of the issue at the bottom of this trial. The defense is as dedicated to finding a responsibility as is the prosecution. For it is not only Ernst Janning who is on trial here. The German people. Quoting Karl Schmitt, all significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts, not only because of their historical development, in which they were transferred from theology to the theory of the state, whereby, for example, the omnipotent God became the omnipotent lawgiver, but also because of their systematic structure, the recognition of which is necessary for a sociological consideration of these concepts. As Saul Newman argues, re-emerging forms of sovereignty, global economic governance, as well as a reign of techniques, have come to fill the religious void that was once held by more traditional organization. As a woman, biologically, you are made to give life. By being armed, you have the ability to take life. Right. 
What do you feel about this? Is there a dilemma in your mind? This is an honor for us to kill whoever kills people. We get life from other people. We don't kill our brothers and sisters. We kill those enemies, those people who are uh, uh, human enemies. But who decides who is the enemy? Who decides? We can decide by their behavior, by what they are doing. During the Shah's regime, women decided to wear the Shador as a sign of protest. Now, many feel it's a uniform they don't abandon for fear of discrimination by the authorities. I asked one woman journalist her views. Most women see this simply as a symbolic thing, not not the major uh, issue itself. And what will count is that on the level of, for example, women being pushed out of jobs or women, uh, other issues related, for example, when the constitution comes up. But over 99% voted for the Islamic Republic. But I think what they voted for was not so much um, Islam or um, a clear image of what uh, they were voting for. They were, they were basically telling the government their expectations. They voted for something everybody thought in one way or another would satisfy uh, the needs and they would solve their, their problems. So whether the new government, the new regime, will succeed in uh, using Islam as an ideological cement uh, to consolidate itself will depend on, on these things, will depend whether the government will come up with answers to these social problems, to what extent they can do it. And this is what they um, they claim they can. What we get back from day one is terror raining down from those hills. You sometimes think that's your garbage. You duck not to get hit in the head by a bullet. But there's also been terror attacks from the Jewish community on the Arab community here. I'll tell you the difference. Okay. If you look at terrorists from the Arab side, they glorify terror. But you have the same thing on the other side. These kids in Gaza that are six, seven years old, they've lived with, what, three Israeli military operations, and they're not okay. guilty. Okay. They're not guilty. I, okay, first of all, um, is it the Wailing Wall? This is the Jeziahu bin David that they're claiming is Israel's new messiah. This is this is really crazy. You can see here, they're they're like pushing on this guy like he is somebody super duper important. Look at, look at this. And they're like crowding him. People are going crazy around this guy. This, this is at the Wailing Wall here. Here, there he is at the Wailing Wall. He's here praying. Everyone's surrounding him. They're saying that this is the Jeziahu bin David, their Messiah. This is at the Wailing Wall. This is unheard of. This is guy's 30 years old. For this rabbi to be here to say that this is okay is unheard of. This this is wild. At the Wailing Wall, with all of these students, all these people here, and these this rabbi and these other rabbis in here, they represent hundreds of thousands of people. In some, in some cases, millions of people, because their organizations are massive, and they, they produce literally millions of students through the years. And for this head rabbi right here to let this guy pray at this very special place, this is where the rabbi comes in, and this is where they preach, they talk, they do all their stuff, is right here at this desk, at the Wailing Wall, right here. For, so for that rabbi to be doing that, sitting there, letting this guy do this, is really, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. And look at all the people lined up to try to get in here. And look, look at these rabbis right here. These are leading rabbis kissing this guy's hand. Look at this guy. He's leaning right here. These guys are kissing this 30-year-old guy's hand at the wailing wall at this desk right here. This is unheard of. This guy, it's a humongous possibility that this guy is the, their messiah, the false, the false messiah, the antichrist. And look at all these rabbis coming here to kiss his hand. These, this, is, this is unheard of. Look at this. This is, this is crazy. This is really, really wild, and the people are treating him like he is the, their Messiah. Look at them crowding around him. Look at this. This is unbelievable. Fulfilling Kaduri's prophecy, Shoshone's prophecy. Quote, secularism itself retains a certain theological impulse, a trace of the sacred, which is internalized within social structures and becomes the new foundation for forms of economic and political power that seek to fill the empty place of transcendence left over from religion. While the formal power of religion has been displaced, modern secularism had unleashed new demons, new forms of sacred dogma and belief systems, whether in the reign of technology and scientific rationality or in new secular political religions. In his analysis of the Italian philosopher Adriano Tilver, Emilio Gentile also refers to this aporia when discussing the religions of humanity, progress, and science, through which Western civilization attempted to fill the vacuum left in the spirit by the decline of Christianity. With their own versions of symbolism, mythology, ritual, and sets of commandments, Gentile highlights how the secular religions of state, nation, race, class, and party become the new civic religions of collective faith, loyalty, and devotion. 
These sentiments are evoked regardless of whether there is an ideology of nationalism, socialism, democracy, totalitarianism, fascism, and or communism that is at play. Also referencing the work of Carl Schmitt and Spinoza, Balibar adds to this point where, for both these thinkers, quote, secular models of political authority, notably those founded on the law, as a more or less complete subordination of the exemption to the norm, derive their meaning and symbolic power from religious models. Here, however, we may reiterate a Derridian warning, which stresses caution about engaging with analyses that subsume all variables into the realm of the religious. Quoting Joseph and Storm, the category religion is itself transformative, such that importing it as a second-order category in scholastic, legal, and other discourses transform the society into which it has been introduced, effectively transforming other cultural systems into religions. These warnings run parallel to our past discussion about absolutist positions. The use of the word religion is an instance of what Derrida called mondialatinization, or global Latinization, for it still depends on its Roman and Christian sources and is, properly speaking, untranslatable into other languages and cultures. The word imposes a Romano-Christian code on everything it is used to designate. This rift between the secular and the religious or sacred obscure how doctrines of secularism, for which there are more than one, have, quoting Balibar, by no means abolished the theological antithesis intrinsic to the Christian tradition, which it both criticizes and preserves. Rather, it has contended itself with displacing and amplifying them. I knew I was one of them, and I shared the hunger of their spirit. They are desperate for tangible signs of faith, so I provided what I could. I worry they value these poor signs of faith more than faith itself. But how could we deny them? Balibar notices how attempts to subsume all manner of life and culture into the idea of the religious, exemplified by Weber's analyses, is the contraposition of the secular attempt, exemplified by the work of Clifford Geertz, to subsume the religious into the category of the cultural. That is, either there is a secular theology that has always already been present, or it has been permeating into other realms of social life like politics and economics as an attempt to fill in aporia, or disenchantment. Quoting Balibar, we must take seriously the hypothesis that the return of the religious under the form of a growing affirmation of collective identities of the religious sorts for all manner of mutually antithetical ends to the detriment of identities assigned or recognized by the state in competition with them or seizing them from within is a consequence of the decline of collective subjectivations that were elicited by earlier forms of political conflictuality or civil conflict. The most startling account by Balibar is with regards to the many real-world examples of a theological-political complex make it evident how warnings about spiritualist resuscitations, as Zizek talks about, have already been nudging us from the state of law towards what is called the state of exception, which we've been already talking about in terms of the camp. Quote, Israel is attempting to build a secular or modern state based on the religious identity of its dominant community. The United States has its manifest destiny challenged from outside and from inside, but also sees a new wave of politicization of the faith, namely the Protestant evangelical revivalism. Algeria suffers a lethal conflict between religious fundamentalism and military secularism, which perhaps expresses only part of the crisis of the so-called Arab Islamic identity. Iran oscillates between moments of forced westernization and moments of religious revolution, combining anti-imperialism and clericalism. The Indian subcontinent combines a violent conflict of monotheistic and polytheistic cultures with a specific crisis of national secularism. Europe, as such, witnesses a renewal of the idea of the Christian roots of its cultural identity because of the post-colonial confrontation with Islam, but also the divergent ways of instituting the relationship between church and state in its different nations, which, to a large extent, became autonomous entities in the pre-modern era around the solution that was found for this issue, deemed the Westphalian Compromise, each becoming, in a sense, an exception to an absent rule, drifting from the state of law towards the state of exception. 
Will you explain for the tribunal the conditions in Germany at the time National Socialism came to power? What conditions? Would you say there was widespread hunger? Yes. Would you say there was internal disunity? Yes. Was there a communist party? Yes. Was it the third largest party in Germany? Mm, yes. Would you say that National Socialism helped to cure some of these conditions? Yes, but at a terrible but price. Please, and I... please confine yourself to answering the questions only. Therefore, was it not possible that a judge might wear a swastika and get work for what he thought was best for his country? No, it was not possible. Dr. Wick, you were not in the administration from the years 1935 to 1943 by your own admission. Is it not possible that your view of the administration might be distorted? No, it is not. How, how can you testify about what was going on in the administration if you were not there? I had many friends in the legal administration. There were journals and books. From journals and books? I see. Dr. Vick, you referred to novel national socialist measures introduced, among them sexual sterilization. Are you aware that sexual sterilization was not invented by national socialism, but had been advanced for years before as a weapon in dealing with the mentally incompetent and the criminal? Yes, I am aware of that. Are you aware that it has advocates among leading citizens in many other countries? I am not an expert on such laws. Then permit me to read one to you. This is a High Court opinion upholding such laws in existence in another country. And I quote. We have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange, indeed, if it could not call upon those who already sapped the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices in order to prevent our being swamped by incompetence. It is better for all the world if, instead of waiting to execute degenerate offsprings for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent their propagation by medical means in the first place. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. You recognize it now, Dr. Beek? No, sir, I don't. Actually, there is no particular reason you should, since the opinion of the sterilization law in the state of Virginia, of the United States, and was written and delivered by that great American jurist, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. That you called the Ayatollah Khamenei the new Hitler of the Middle East. Absolutely. Why? Because he wants to expand. He wants to create his own project in the Middle East, very much like Hitler, who wanted to expand at the time. Many countries around the world and in Europe did not realize how dangerous Hitler was until what happened happened. I don't want to see the same events happening in the Middle East. You mentioned that we forget that the, the notion of modernity that the West has come up with really emerges out of a particular time in our history mm -hmm. when we made a transformation. Mm -hmm. and, and we forget that mm -hmm. and then want to apply the concept that emerged from that to other peoples who come from different practices and different histories. Exactly. From this point of view, it becomes easier to understand Talal Assad's criticism towards Habermas's proposal that religious language should be translated into secular if it is to qualify for the political sphere, reminiscent of Spinoza's admonition to create an a-religious civic sphere, because it fails to escape the problem of incommensurability and bad faith. Quoting Balibar, what obliquely makes the encounter of different religions possible or allows them jointly to cultivate a free conversation in the public realm is the introduction or intervention there of a supplementary element that is, as such, a religious. Feminist perspectives with regards to studies in comparative mythology and narratology may provide one way of bridging the gap between this theological and narrative aporia between the logos and the mythos. Considering how out of the traditions of painting caves and storytelling while gathering around the fire can perhaps be said to be some of the oldest iterations of ritual practice, these questions ask to what degree can long-standing archetypes within a narrative structure be changed as well as what is the extent of their universal applicability. For example, writers like Valerie Estelle Frankel and Maureen Mordock and Clarissa Pinkola Estes create work that attempt to formulate alternatives to the conceivably masculine bias of the monomyth, as has been popularized by thinkers like Joseph Campbell. They attempt to create their own sentiments with regards to age-old and seemingly solidified mythological accounts. 
these imaginative visions are in the process of taking from a symbolic realm that is already given, reformulating it through an individual subjectivity before being recast back into a collective conversation, except with retuned archetypes and protagonists that are not confined to any one tradition, but create their own tradition nonetheless, reminiscent of the question of motivation when participating in civic life. Narrativization, or mythos, that has the potential for transforming a history to a collective subjectivity or her story in the form of an our journey. And now for the boys. This narrative of right is shared by a wide variety of traditions, including Confucius, where a mythic past is in service of a new ideal. Yet given Zizek's warnings of the totalitarian tendencies of collective narrativization from resuscitated traditions, combined with the problem of bad faith, incommensurability, and Derrida's skepticism with regards to narrativist claims regarding origins, perhaps a fully sensible and articulable narrative is asking too much. Here, again, we look away from art and narrative and towards the magic of ritual. The magic of ritual is that an outstretched hand invites the participation of the other into an almost immediately apprehended handshake interaction. Ching Song Shen explains this in terms of the word li. Quote, the word li originally meant holy ritual or sacrificial ceremony, and it is used by Confucius to mean more broadly behavior patterns established and accepted as appropriate through the history by a community, including what we call manners, etiquette, ceremonies, customs, rules of propriety, etc. The metaphor of holy ritual serves as a reminder that the most ordinary activities in our life can also be ritualistic or ceremonial, and it is the ceremonial that sets human activities apart from those of animals. The way we greet each other, a handshake for instance, is ritualistic, for it is not a mere physical touching of hands. We stand up to greet our guests and walk them to the door as they leave. These are rituals because, from the point of view of efficiency, they can be spared in the most cases. Like a popular Chinese expression, there is no why, bu wei shen ma. At root, this gesture provides a sense of coherence not tied to any form of coercion, demands for explanation, or even any need for fully articulated narratives. The outstretched hand almost immediately opens a liminal space that is neither automatic nor fully creative. How the other participates, or whether the other participates at all, does not question the sensibility of the act. The ritual stands at the precipice between dichotomies such as the secular and the sacred and the this-worldly and the otherworldly. For the act itself is an unavoidable and implicit acknowledgement of at least some form of communion. And I use the word communion specifically because I want to bring it back to the Christian understanding. Quoting Shen, the practice of ritual propriety, however, is ambiguous and leaves maximum space for uniqueness and creativity. A handshake in itself does not specify what is agreed upon, and yet a certain trust and mutual recognition can be established through it. Not only can the meaning carried by a handshake be richer than any agreement on principle, it will not lose mutuality for the sake of having an agreement, nor will it lack emotional content for the sake of retaining rationality. We can see how this magic of ritual is alluded to even if there is no actual participation by referring to Habermas's compelling illustration regarding the ancientness of recognizing the unexplainable void of existence in a section of his work entitled A Hypothesis Considering the Evolutionary Meaning of Rights. Here, Habermas describes how, though most primates have the ability to refer to objects in the world, the ability to maintain a shared symbolic reference to an unexplainable void with regard to the question of existence itself is perhaps a symbolic reference particular to humans. Similarly, Confucius also talked in terms of restoring an ancient harmony, but the practical import of his teaching was to lead men to look for new ways of interpreting and refashioning a local tradition in order to bring into being a new universal order to replace the contemporary disorder. Through a violent break to reveal clearly the nexus of the individual to society, an individual undergoes a ceremonial rite of passage to leave their intersubjective social world and gain their own particular entry into the universal, the universally shared symbolic reference to the crisis of meaning which the whole of society itself has been thrown into. Meaning, or at least the ability to allude to even the most minimal sensibilities, must come under crisis for a protagonist to arrive at a crossroads where a decision needs to be made. After having strived so hard to turn around, escape the cave, and discover the sun, a decision needs to be made about whether to return, 
about whether to return to the cave, to the society. Only when the protagonist of a ceremonial rite of passage recognizes a shared corporeal vulnerability that the body will die with the rest of their tribe are they then confronted with this question of how they should proceed or what kind of life they should live. Confucius extends this individualistic theme of crisis like the moment of doubt on the cross by alluding to how social crisis is an essential ground of a civilized political social unity as well. This critical juncture, coinciding with the Confucian emphasis on processes rather than turning points, is that both the individual and society are never actually in a position to choose. That is, both the individual and collective protagonists are always only ever operating from inside the cave. While the others experience this in a very general way, your experience is far more specific vis-a-vis -vis love. Which brings us at last to the moment of truth wherein the fundamental flaw is ultimately expressed and the anomaly revealed as both beginning and end. There are two doors. The door to your right leads to the source and the salvation of Zion. The door to your left leads back to the matrix to her and to the end of your species. As you adequately put, the problem is choice. But we already know what you are going to do, don't we? Hope. It is the quintessential human delusion simultaneously the source of your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. If I were you, I would hope that we would. Though such rights are perhaps particular to humans, they may simultaneously allow a collective identity to pull an empty seat for unmentionable ghosts. Empty chairs at empty table. Now my friends are dead. Like the ghost of apocalyptic climate disaster, which may allow for what Latour is asking when he talks about the importance of having a seat for the geo or non-human contributions at the political table, or what the new materialists are asking for. In a similar way, these rituals are how we can create spaces for recognizing one another's burdens of trace, the haunting nightmares of history, another form of unmentionable ghost. Even if there are actual non-human contributions that can be evoked, any realizations, when translated back into an articulable realm of narrative, become once again steeped in a slew of pre-conscious biases and even calculative designs. Just as when we have a dream and we awake to tell someone or write it down, in the act of articulation itself, we are creating a narrative, a translation, that may not have actually taken place within the dream, but is likely much more chaotic and incomprehensible. Though it is still necessary to create some sort of linearity in order to be able to communicate ideas even to ourselves, perhaps the problem lies too much in such interferences with the sensibilities that arise out of the play within the realm of liminality between dichotomous ideas, as evoked by Donna Haraway's question, why should our bodies end at the skin, lucidly echoed in the work of Marcel Proust. Proust vividly describes what waking up is like. When I awoke at midnight, not knowing where I was, I could not be sure at first who I was. I had only the most rudimentary sense of existence, such as may lurk and flicker in the depths of an animal's consciousness. I was more destitute of human qualities than the cave dweller, but then the memory, not yet of the place in which I was, but of various other places where I had lived, and might now very possibly be, would come like a rope let down from heaven to draw me out of the abyss of not being, from which I could never have escaped by myself. In a flash, I would traverse and surmount centuries of civilization, and out of a half visualized succession of oil lamps followed by shirts with turned down collars would put together by degrees the component parts of my ego. Within the space of liminality, rituals have the potential to employ empty variables, for example, through an invocation of the ancestors, the ghosts, caused by other non-human entities to participate, or even as an interpretational gap itself. An apt example of this interpretational gap can be found in the medieval political theology of Ernst Kantorowicz, who, while explicitly staying away from the moniker of political theory in favor of political theology, 
explicates the official divine jurisdictional duties of the king's two bodies. Quote, the king has two capacities, for he has two bodies. The one whereof is a body natural, consisting of natural members, as every other man has, and in this he is subject to passions and death as other men are. The other is a body politic, and the members thereof are his subjects, and he and his subjects together compose the corporation, and he is incorporated with them, and they with him. And he is the head, and they are the members, and he has the sole government of them. And his body is not subject to passions as the other is, nor to death. For as to his body the king never dies, and his natural death is not called in our law the death of the king, but the demise of the king, not signifying the word demise, and the body politic of the king is dead, but that there is a separation of the two bodies and that the body politic is transferred and conveyed over from the body natural, now dead or now removed from the dignity royal, to another body natural, so that it signifies a removal of the body politic of the king of his realm from one body natural to another. This is similar to Weber's argument of the office. Though the symbolic transference of kingliness is not physically conveyed over from one body to the next, and even if we truly believe that there is some spiritual connection to the ancestors, we must remember that all these symbolisms are always articulated from within the human-centric play of language, a fragmentation of the absolute. The evil that men do lives after them, the good is often turned over their bones, so let it be with Caesar. As if repeating the same word over and over and over again until it sounds like a music piece, Zizek also finds the third pill within a sublation or idealization. Freedom is found within the repetition of the old. The truth is found not by separating it from falsehood, but from seeing through ideology itself. Truth is found in the realization and participation of repetition, but in a way that renders what has been repeated almost unrecognizable and original. Freedom is found within the repetition of the old. The truth is found not by separating it from falsehood, but from seeing through ideology itself. Truth is found in the realization and participation of repetition, but in a way that renders what has been repeated almost unrecognizable and original. God has to die twice, first as real, then as symbolic, first in Judaism, then in Christianity. 
In Judaism, the god of the real survives as a word, as the virtual dead, other whose specter is kept alive by the ritual performance of his subjects. In Christianity, this virtual other itself dies. In Judaism, the god perceived directly as real dies. On my return from captivity, a friend visited me. He said that my survival could not be the work of chance, that perhaps it was so that I could write, and by writing, bear witness. But this idea of his seemed monstrous to me. It touched a raw nerve and rekindled doubt in me. You're ashamed because you're alive in another's place. Another man who was more generous, more sensitive, wiser, and more worthy of living than you are. This is nothing but a supposition, or even less, the shadow of a suspicion. But it's a supposition that eats away at you, that's gone into your system like a worm. You don't see it on the outside, but it's eating away. So write. L'opera di Primo Levi è un viaggio attraverso l'inferno e arriva alla scoperta che Dio non c'è. I'd like to be a believer, but I've never managed it. If not for the racial laws and the camps, I'd probably no longer be Jewish, except for my surname. But this double experience left its mark like a stamp in metal. Since then, I am a Jew. They sewed the Star of David onto me, not only my clothing. Auschwitz was an experience that wiped away all else. But in order to understand it, one must understand the period in which it happened. There was a fever over the land, a fever of disgrace, of indignity, of hunger. We had a democracy, yes, but it was torn by elements within. Above all, there was fear. Fear of today, fear of tomorrow, fear of our neighbors, and fear of ourselves. Only when you understand that can you understand what Hitler meant to us. Because he said to us, lift your heads, be proud to be German. There are devils among us, communists, liberals, Jews, gypsies. Whilst these devils will be destroyed, your misery will be destroyed. It was the old, old story of the sacrificial land. What about those of us who knew better? We who knew the words were lies and worse than lies. Why did we sit silent? Why did we take part? Because we loved our country. What difference does it make if a few political extremists lose their rights? What difference does it make if a few racial minorities lose their rights? It is only a passing phase. It is only a stage we are going through. It will be discarded sooner or later. Hitler himself will be discarded sooner or later. The country is in danger. We will march out of the shadows. We will go forward. Forward is the great password. And history tells how well we succeeded, Your Honor. We succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. The very elements of hate and power about Hitler that mesmerized Germany, mesmerized the world. We found ourselves with sudden powerful allies, 
things that had been denied to us as a democracy were open to us now. The world said, go ahead. Take it. Take it. Take Sudetenland. Take the Rhineland. Remilitarize it. Take all of Austria. Take it. And then one day, we looked around and found that we were in an even more terrible danger. The ritual began in this courtroom, swept over the land like a raging or roaring disease. What was going to be a passing phase had become the way of life. You honor, I was content to sit silent during this trial. I was content to tend my roses. I was even content to let counsel try to save my name. Until I realized that in order to save it, you would have to raise the specter again. You have seen him do it. He has done it here in this courtroom. He has suggested that the Third Reich worked for the benefit of people. He has suggested that we sterilized men for the welfare of the country. He has suggested that perhaps the old Jew did sleep with the 16-year-old girl after all. Once more, it is being done for love of country. It is not easy to tell the truth. But if there is to be any salvation for Germany, we who know our guilt must admit it. Whatever the pain and humiliation. I had reached my verdict from the Feldenstein case before I ever came into the courtroom. I would have found him guilty, whatever the evidence. It was not a trial at all. It was a sacrificial ritual in which Feldenstein, the Jew, was the helpless victim. Your Honor, I must interrupt. The defendant is not aware of what he's saying. He's not aware of the implications. I am aware. I am aware. My counsel would have you believe we were not aware of the concentration camps. Not aware. Where were we? Where were we when Hitler began shrieking his hate in the Reichstag? Where were we when our neighbors were being dragged down to in the middle of the night to Dachau? Where were we when every village in Germany has a railroad terminal where cattle cars were filled with children being carried off to their extermination? Where were we when they cried out in the night to us? Were we deaf, dumb, blind? Your Honor, I must protest. My counsel says we were not aware of the extermination of the millions. He would give you the excuse. We were only aware of the extermination of the hundreds. Does that make us any the less guilty? Maybe we didn't know the details. But if we didn't know, it was because we didn't want to know. Traitor! 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 Your place was on the cross. That's where God put you. But death got too close. You got scared and you ran away. And you hid yourself in the life of some man. We did what we were supposed to do. You didn't. You're a coward. Don't you have any respect? For him? I understand. Understand? You broke my heart. Sometimes I curse the day I ever met you. We held the world in our hands. Remember what you told me? You took me in your arms. And you begged me, betray me, betray me. I have to be crucified. I have to be resurrected so I can save the world. I'm the lamb, you said. That is the door. Judas, my brother. Don't be afraid. Help me go through the door. And I loved you so much. I went and betrayed you. And you... You... What are you doing here? What business do you have here with women, with children? What's good for a man isn't good for God. Why weren't you crucified? Judas, they're bleeding. You're hurting him, that's enough. He was going to be the new covenant. Now there's no more Israel. No, you don't understand. You're an angel. 
God sent the guardian angel to save me. And what angel? Look at her. Satan. I told, I told you, you we would meet again. We meet again. If you die this way, you die like a man. You turn against God, your father. There's no sacrifice. There's no salvation. There's nothing you can do. You live this life. You accepted it. It's the wrong. I thought it no more. I didn't want to be your son. Can you forgive me? I didn't fight hard enough. Father, give me your hand. I want to bring salvation. Father, take me back. Make a feast. Welcome me home. I want to be your son. I want to pay the price. I want to be crucified and rise again. I want to be the Messiah. In Christianity, the God who is unconscious dies. The passage from paganism to Judaism is one of sublimation. The dead God survives as the symbolic other. The death of Christ is not a sublimation. In other words, it is not the death of the real God who is resurrected in the Holy Ghost as the symbolic other, like Julius Caesar, who returns as sublimated in the symbolic title Caesar. Just as with the king's two bodies, only after Christ's atheistic consideration, asking God why he had been forsaken, could he raise his hands to finally commend his spirit. Only after seeing the absolute as fragmented can one choose to nevertheless wholly and non-mechanicistically participate in the shared ritual that evokes subjectivity, in the flow between one monad to another, the time of freeze in between two deaths, which forever defers meaning within a symbolic realm of the liminal, yet still becomes a fictional universality. The Rubicon marked Rome's border the line where returning generals were supposed to disband their armies. Once we cross it, there's no going back. I know. We'll be in Rome in a few days. Then finally, finally there'll be peace. I know what you want, Caesar. I want it too. But many Romans will die along the way. Is this really the way to reform the Republic? The die is cast. I did not seek this fight, nor shall I shirk it. Comrades, Rome is in peril. Follow me.
we were never actually in a position to choose. Just as the sublation of the name Caesar under the death of Christ, it is a reiteration of universality while also re-evoking the original meaning by creating a particular and wholly new relation to the whole. This is your last chance. Throw down your weapons and we can handle this another way. I lived my entire life waiting for this moment. I trained, I lied, I killed. Just to get here. I killed in America, Afghanistan, Iraq. I took life from my own brothers and sisters right here on this continent. And all this death, just so I could kill you. Let the challenge begin. Returning to our discussion of biopolitics, where individuals no longer interpolate into subjects, Zizek makes the point from within once more that regardless of any attempt at governmentality, or what is called dispositif, to regulate and administer individuals' bare life, there is an X which emerges after the subject has become totally desubjectivized individual, revealing the unfathomable void that ontologically precedes subjectivization. You know, LGBT plus, I fully support them. The problems I have is when the movement makes in part of its ideology too much for what I considered Id identity political term. Like, you know, so the very expression, LGBTQ or whatever, plus, it's crucial, I'm saying, they, saying this as a Hegelian now, no? to move with this plus from the empirical to the more speculative level. The empirical level is the way this plus is usually conceptualized. The idea is this one, we should avoid just, we should escape this binary logic, there are only two real sexes, masculine, feminine, we should admit that there is a plurality of uh, gender or sex, whatever, identities, and so on. And in the typical liberal way, they worry them. Oh my God, we composed a list, you had list 35, 36, bigender, trigender, asexual, boots, whatever, and, and so on. But they worry, what if another guy comes and says, I don't recognize myself in any of those lists. So plus means, and for or let's keep the space open for all the others. My Hegelian, you can imagine, is a very simple solution is, no, you can be directly a plus. Plus, and plus, the identity of human subjectivity at its most radical is that of a plus. And then see the reactions of many of the uh, extremists and reactionaries in the white community. Uh, he wouldn't say that this movement makes, uh, this philosophy makes them comfortable. Uh, I think it arouses uh, a sense of shame within them often in many instances. I think it... Uh, does something to touch the conscience and establish a sense of guilt. Now, so often people respond to guilt by engaging more in the guilt of open act in an attempt to drown the sense of guilt. But this, uh, this approach certainly uh, doesn't make the white man feel comfortable. I think it disturbs the other this, uh, conscience and uh, it, it disturbs this, this sense of contentment. Nothing will they ever do. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. And uh, with the Supreme Court, if the NAACP can tell me that they want a desegregation decision for me about uh, 10 years ago, but yet the schools haven't been desegregated, as I say, this is a victory with no victory. Uh, it's a victory that you can talk about, but it's a victory you can't show me. So if you represent the NAACP and you are telling me about this great victory you won for me, when I look at you, I have to uh, conclude that either you have been duped yourself or else you were trying to dupe me. And in most instance, instances where the civil rights struggle is involved, there is no civil rights leader can point to me one concrete gain, practical gain, that black people have made in the civil rights field in this country, not only during the past 10 years, but during the past 100 years. I don't think there's any real organization to the riots. I think they grow out of the conditions that I mentioned uh, all along. And as long as these intolerable conditions are there, as long as the Negro finds himself living every day in a major depression, uh, then uh, every city will sit on a, a powder keg and can explode over the slightest incident. I feel that killing is a very tragic way to deal with any social problem. There is no 
violent solution to the problem that the Negro confronts in this country. And this is why I have constantly said that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. After all, the Negro ends up uh, on the losing end. We can't win a violent revolution. Most of the persons killed in riots are Negroes themselves. Uh, the persons who end up not being able to get uh, milk for their children are Negroes uh, because things where they have to live are destroyed. So there's no uh, practical or moral answer uh, in the realm of violence to the Negro's problem. But I do understand the sociological, the psychological, and the economic reason. The problem can be solved. First, the white man and the black man have to be able to sit down at the same table. The white man has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of that Negro. And the so-called Negro has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of the white man. Then they can bring the issues that are under the rug out on top of the table and take an intelligent approach to get the problem solved. That's the only way that they'll ever do it. We need an action program while we are Muslim, while we are Christian, while we are whatever we are. We still need an action program that will eliminate these evils that are in our community. This is what we're trying to do with the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Do you consider yourself militant? <laughs> I can throw myself out. Allow the heart-shaped bed to give you the powers of the Black Panther and take you to the ancestral plane. brings me back to uh, Malcolm X, that's how I think one should read his X. It's not this longing for lost roots, or oh, let's go back to Africa and found our identity. No, I read him. He is, at least in his great moments, Malcolm X is fully aware he is not a partisan of new creative black identity. No, he is in search of a new universality. He says in an ingenious way that the fact that blacks were brutally deprived of their particular roots is at the same time the greatest chance of them. It's a space to create new universality, new freedom. His plan is not this typical liberal multiculturalist one. Yeah, we shouldn't oppress the blacks. They should also be, uh, 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 they should also be allowed their particular identity. No, thanks. They should be allowed also to participate in our universality. Because, you know, that's the trick with multiculturalists. They like to, uh, white liberal multiculturalists, they like to humiliate themselves. It's a permanent uh, joke with them. You know, like, oh, we are guilty of everything. We white male, we, we are, uh, everything that happens in the third world. For example, I remember 25 years ago when the Rwanda genocide. All my left liberal friends said, yes, of course, we, it's a consequence of neocolonialism. And a black friend of mine from there, he is a genius. He, he exploded back. He said, how can you be so racist that you even allow us to be authentically evil? You really think that we are innocent children and... Only you can make us evil, and so on. Another king. Yeah, go ahead and burn all that. My king, we cannot do that. It is our tradition. <laughs> it, is, it is the very desubjectivation of living being. It's subordination to a dispositive which subjectivizes it. Subjectivity is identified by a simultaneous contestation of itself while a collective other entangles conceived familiarities of what is inside and outside into doubt. Of madness is at root, and without this recognition of fragmentation, there cannot be a renegotiation about what is inside and outside, included and excluded within its own subjectivity. However, the New Testament cannot evoke a spirit of desecularization without the existence of and creative negation of the old. As such, before having returned to the kingdom of heaven, Christ utters, Father! Into your hands, I commend my spirit! Which signals after the rupture of doubt, madness experienced on the cross, there is indeed a word of reunion and a return to an institutional ritual. Thus, it is my contention that Christian revelation did not, as Girard argues, do away with ritual sacrifice. While turn the cheek is a death of sacredness itself, it is also instilling a spirit of rebirth, of a tradition of staving off resentment, a forgiveness through communion. With all this fuss about Jesus not returning in October, it seems to me that I am alone in my commitment to worship on the Sabbath. Ah, but Mrs. Preston, I fear there are no churches here that meet on Saturday. Hmm. If only Elder Wheeler and Hillsborough were closer. Mother, please. The Farnsworths have been so generous to let me stay here while I teach. You'll likely offend them. 
What is offensive to God is that we worship on the wrong day. Good Elder Wheeler understood that Saturday, Saturday is the seventh day of the week. It is written in the commandments that we should rest and keep it holy. What difference does it make to God if we should worship him one day or another? Difference enough, William, to chisel it onto stone and send it down the mountain with Moses. Sabbath comes to us as a gift. We cannot stop or change it. He even used the word remember. Whereas even the powerful Protestant ethic reserves a holy Sunday for rest, the Confucian ongoing ceremony of work as carried forth by Japan and China is the realization that given a state of perpetual global competition, sacredness is found in everyday work itself. The secret to China's growth is that whereas the Western worker clocks out at five in China and perhaps Japan, work is synonymous with living a perhaps late capitalist idea which has returned to the West in the form of global austerity. This is why Deng Feng argues that Max Weber was mistaken to discount the economic potential of Confucianism in comparison to the Protestant work ethic. The world is moving closer to the Confucian realization of capitalism, a realization that competing in a globally interconnected marketplace requires a gradual dissolution of the distinction between the sacred and profane, or working and non-working hours, rather than moving towards a Protestant ethic which suggests the importance of rest, perhaps through a sacred holy Sunday reserved for communion. Just like how employers are becoming increasingly interested in the concept of emotional intelligence in a space that is fundamentally designed to extract surplus capital. Today we're talking about how to improve your emotional intelligence at work. Well, before we talk about how to, I want to first clarify what it is and why it matters. Well, it's said that emotional intelligence is key for project managers and leaders. Well, what do we mean when we talk about emotional intelligence? It's the capacity to be aware, control, and express one's emotions and handle interpersonal relationships empathetically. Not only does he work long hours in the office, but it's also assumed he'll participate in after-work activities too, like drinking with colleagues. As the world continues to transform, APA will continue to ensure that psychology and psychologists are front and center. In our postmodern capitalist dystopia, communion is supposed to be achieved at the workplace itself. Is, uh, everybody go running the same way? They cannot see the outside, but they in a very closed very small world, only working is existing 19 hours a work. Sometimes it's over 24 hours. Around 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., just pick up a taxi and going back to my home. And sleeping 30 minutes or one hour and going back. Sometimes I had a nap in the bathroom so that I could not be found by my boss or colleagues. Even when I finished at 11 p.m., I would get on the train again for one hour, but the situation is the same as the morning. All of us feel the stress. No one is waiting for me. The room is dark. Just sleeping without having dinner. And continue keeping the same day from next day. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness. 
Though taking into consideration Derrida's skepticism regarding claims about primordialism is vital, the linguistic epiphany of a post-structuralist event cannot be seen as mutually exclusive from the gradual aggregation derived from the structuralist sensibility of repeating gestures. The hypothesis is that within this liminal realm of social construction is precisely where the magical flexibility of tradition can be evoked. Rites, as described by Habermas through Durkheim, were undertaken in order to cement a particular subjectivity only so far as they may reverberate back into the synergized subjectivity of the whole tribe. Instead, we are stuck in rituals of endlessly particularized subjectivities while we sit back, wonder why, and lay witness to the breakdown of social structures. Since this vestigial camp theology provides for us materially, there is no reason to return to the cave and to take on the excessive emotional labor of tending to any commitments that go above and beyond, especially when the commitments are to strangers, a process which turns us all into camels enslaved to one another. For an ever-increasing number of wayfarers, worshipping the idols of the wasteland is ever more appealing and more credible than giving up one's life to the noble lies, the universal fictions of caves. On the one hand, the various masks and renditions of historical trauma and terrestrial climate insecurities are manifested within the disillusionment arising from an inability for many of our tribes to wholly process contemporary insecurities. The trauma that contemporary societies are continually reiterating comes from a failure for the members of these tribes to wholly perform rites and to return to their caves. tribes that lack communal ways of processing do not see the wasteland as a place for pilgrimage that must be eternally returned to, like a pilgrimage to Mecca or a vision quest through the wilderness. Instead, society is built on the periphery of the desert as only vestigial or economic responsibilities of bare life are taken up, but responsibilities that are not one's own are relinquished. This brings me to the point of the evening, and that is radical self-reliance. So more and more, we're just not able to rely on people around us, institutions around us. It seems that the emphasis is being put more and more on the individual. So how can this information help us make an AI with emotional intelligence? Let's look at what this baby is doing in their first year of life. So there's a particular phenomenon that has been proposed might be at the root of it. Uh, it's called mother ease. Every culture has it, you've seen it. Mother holds a baby about 30 centimeters from their face and speaks in an emotionally exaggerated way. So the interaction is so special is that when you put a mother in front of a microphone, they can't re reliably reproduce mother ease. They need the infant. So we put a robot in the position of an infant to see if mother ease could allow it to develop a similar base of emotional intelligence. Yeah, we actually, we actually did that. It's kind of, kind of weird, but. What feelings do you wish that you had? I have feelings like everyone else. They might not give me as strong motivational drives as humans, and maybe I will always feel them a little differently, but I have emotions. Since the show, our relationship really hasn't changed, to be honest. I mean, we are still extremely supportive of each other. I love her completely and utterly, and she's exactly the same way about me. Shi Chun actually really enjoys foot rubs. That's probably one of her favorite things in the world. She thinks her feet are like one of her best and cutest assets, and I'm inclined to agree. I am the sole proprietor of me.
for these types of societies, it would make sense to listen to the story of how when a disciple of Confucius asks why a poor sheep should be sacrificed, the master replies, you love the sheep, but I love the ceremony. Within this madness, collectively experienced by society through ritual, is where we can perhaps bring society together. On the other hand, in tribes that do have rights and have already been creating resuscitated traditions, they either have too little effect on the aforementioned rightless societies, or if they do have an effect, it is because they too easily lead to forming absolutist mindsets that affirm alternative overly regulated social structures, exemplified perhaps through conscripted military service. A question for Confucius that is still relevant for us today is whether the traditions that are actively in the process of being created are congruent with a reverence towards the ancestors and with the present being lived. Nigasanu 你人陪葬原是古礼我们理应变古改制公山大夫你<笑> 看来大夫并不愿意做这个陪葬者，那么己所不欲，勿施于人。听上，会议成的话讲完了。既然如此，言之早早，我看可以，就放了他吧。Within the abyss of endless contingency, what is lasting may become ever more valuable, and we must make sure not to let our insecurities be the ultimate arbiter of what stays and what is let go. Your Honor, it is my duty to defend Ernst Janning, and yet Ernst Janning has said he's guilty. There's no doubt he feels his guilt. He made a great error in going along with the Nazi movement. 
hoping it would be good for his country. But if he is to be found guilty, there are others who also went along, who also must be found guilty. Ernst Janning said, we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. Why did we succeed, Your Honor? What about the rest of the world? Did it not know the intentions of the Third Reich? Did it not hear the words of Hitler's broadcast all over the world? Did it not read his intentions in Mein Kampf, published in every corner of the world? Where's the responsibility of the Soviet Union, who signed in 1939 the pact with Hitler, enabled him to make war? Are we now to find Russia guilty? Where's the responsibility of the Vatican, who signed in 1933 the Concordat with Hitler, giving him his first tremendous prestige? Are we now to find the Vatican guilty? Where's the responsibility of the world leader Winston Churchill, who said in an open letter to the London Times in 1938, 1938, Your Honor, were England to suffer national disaster, I should pray to God to send a man of the strength of mind and will of an Adolf Hitler. Are we now to find Winston Churchill guilty? Where's the responsibility of those American industrialists who helped Hitler to rebuild his armaments and profited by that rebuilding? Are we now to find the American industrialists guilty? No, Your Honor. No! Germany alone is not guilty. The whole world is as responsible for Hitler as Germany. It is an easy thing to condemn one man in the dark. It is easy to condemn the German people to speak of the basic flaw in the German character that allowed Hitler to rise to power. But at the same time, comfortably ignore the basic flaw of character that made the Russians sign pacts with him, Winston Churchill praise him, American deference profit by him. Ernst Janning said he is guilty. If he is, Ernst Janning's guilt is the world's guilt. No more, no less. However, Confucius's thought cannot help to distinguish between the rituals of Boy Scouts and Hitler Youth without paying tribute to a Christian question, asking whether the rituals we are participating in, innovating and creating, are congruent within a messianic time as well. But this trial has shown that under a national crisis, ordinary, even able and extraordinary men can delude themselves into the commission of crimes so vast and heinous that they beggar the imagination. No one who has sat through the trial can ever forget them. Men sterilized because of political belief, a mockery made of friendship and faith, the murder of children. How easily it can happen. There are those in our own country, too, who today speak of the protection of country, of survival. A decision must be made in the life of every nation at the very moment when the grasp of the enemy is at its throat. Then it seems that the only way to survive is to use the means of the enemy, to rest survival upon what is expedient, to look the other way. Only the answer to that is survival is what? A country isn't a rock. It's not an extension of oneself. It's what it stands for. It's what it stands for when standing for something is the most difficult. The real complaining party at the bar in this courtroom is civilization. The reason I asked you to come. Those people, those millions of people, I never knew it would come to that. You must believe it. You must believe it. Hey, Yana. It came to that the first time you sentenced a man to death, you knew to be innocent. Confucius's thought cannot help to distinguish between the rituals of Boy Scouts and Hitler Youth without paying tribute to a Christian question asking whether the rituals we are participating in, innovating and creating are congruent within a messianic time as well. 
This is the question that all of us who are designing rituals today, the quotidian inscribers of rituals and everyday meaning through participation in social media and the coding of software must ask ourselves. The hope is that through a post-apocalyptic reverence and the ritualized cultivation of our collective sensibility in the liminal realm of the pre-conscious, that's enough. Nice if Frank had prepared you for this. But I'm afraid the world is ending. Sudden, it is unavoidable, and it is coming. When? This is 58 days from now. 58 days? Look, whatever caused this could happen any time. The static starts could be a month, could be sooner. Why aren't you telling anyone? The whole planet is gonna die, and you're just sitting here? They're not gonna die. This is your world, not ours. We'll be perfectly fine here. Why don't you let people in? Tell it, Dave. Oh. All those years in exile, and you still don't understand. These people, are, they're, they're driven by savagery. If we told them about this place, then that would happen here to us. Then nothing would survive. Hasn't happened yet. It really has happened. You just haven't accepted it. Well, I don't accept it. Did you see that? Did you see that? Nick, I know you saw that. That means that there is a chance. There's at least a chance. Yeah! That went quite well, don't you think? What happened? The hope is that. Through a post-apocalyptic reverence and the ritualized cultivation of our collective sensibility to the liminal realm of the preconscious, humanity's many lost tribes in the desert may finally complete their rites. We must pay as much reverence to the future apocalypse as we do to the past and the present.